Hey, Jeannie. Yeah, bro. Who's our guest on the Energy Nerd Show today? Today we have Lucy Cook. Woo! Yay! Hey, Lucy. <laughs> hey there. Welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah. Lucy, Lucy knows a lot about animals, and specifically, I'm curious about sloths. Sloths? Why are we talking about sloths on the Energy Nerd Show? Well, our guest is an expert, they're amazing, and we can learn a lot from the energy efficiency and sustainable lifestyle of sloths. If you look at the um, design decisions that humans make about our appliances, our cars, our factories, our buildings, some things are energy efficient, but by and large, we are wasting a lot of energy and often for no good reason. It's uneconomical, it's bad for the environment, it's just a waste. So for example, if you take the whole US economy and look at a Sankey diagram of the economy, it's basically all the energy input and useful energy out. What you see here for the US is that about two thirds of the energy is you know, rejected energy, i.e. wasted. So you know, if we make our power plants better, our cars better, our buildings better, then we can waste much, much less of this energy to the great benefit of people and the planet. We can learn a lot from sloths. So uh, with that, back to Lucy Cook. What do you love about sloths? What's the weirdest thing? And, and then we'll go on from there. Well, I mean, I think it's very, it's delightful to be here, by the way. Thank you so much for inviting me on uh, the, the Nerd Show, the Energy Nerd Show. And it, it's a very appropriate place for me to be talking about sloths. And the reason why they're one of my favourite animals is because, you know, they are these icons of sustainability, I think, you know, that have been completely misunderstood by humans historically because they're slow. You know, they've been derided for being slow and... and um, Even lazy. In lazy, exactly. I, I think in every language, their name translates as some sort of lazy bear, lazy, you know, some derogatory spin on, on, on being slow or lazy. One of the seven deadly sins. Mm. You know, it's not great, is it? It's not great branding, is it? You know, to be one of the seven deadly sins. But actually, you know, I think that sloth needs to come off the list of seven deadly sins. You know, that should be aspirational. It should be the seven brilliant things, you know, that we should be trying to be is, is more slothful. Because I think that what people don't realise is that they're actually really successful. People think that because they're slow, they're somehow, you know, they've escaped the rigours of natural selection, you know, and they're these aberrant, creatures you know that shouldn't survive but yeah they're really successful I mean they've been around for tens of millions of years and and survived all sorts of things that that uh, that that this for example the saber-toothed tiger where he you know that the sloth is still here you know I mean the reasons why they're so successful is because of their slothfulness you know that is the secret of their success because they don't burn much energy you they're know energy efficient they're energy efficient uh, you know that. They're, exactly yeah. so that's what i think is that they should be these uh, you know these icons of sustainability you know that we should be striving to be more slothful and um that and instead of the we've done with the cheetah you know let's move beyond we're beyond the era of the cheetah and <laughs> idolizing moving faster than nature intended let's let's go with the sloth as our our icon the animal masters of survival and the good life Exactly, yeah. So what do we know about how this being slow helps them be successful? Because I know sometimes I'm crossing a crosswalk too slowly and I'm in danger, right? So there are a lot of things that come with, you know, being quick and saving oneself. So how do, what's so great about how do, how do they figure it out? What's going yeah. on? So basically their diet is is very low energy, right? I think they, it's something like 80 calories a day, a mm. three-toed sloth will survive on. I mean, you can't, that's not even, that's just like a handful of chip, potato chips, isn't <laughs> right. it? I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's nothing. You know, so their entire way of being is around not burning much energy because they're not taking in much energy. Um, and, you know, number one, you sort of think, well, predators you know like how are you going to get away from predators you run from danger is not an option so so they're masters of disguise their fur has grooves in it that trap water and become mini hydroponic gardens for dozens of species of algae so in the rainy season you won't see sloths in the trees because they're green you can't you just can't spot them you know um and incidentally some of those species of algae you know are being looked into as for, for a cure for cancer i think but basically they look and smell like a tree you know so they don't need to that that's their protection from being eaten their brilliant strategy 
Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, they, they disappear. They're like, you know, Harry Houdini in the trees. You can't see them. But the other thing that, that that coat of theirs does is it's really thick for an animal that lives in the tropics. And so they are really unusual for mammals in that they don't maintain a constant body temperature. They have evolved to tolerate a, 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 like a change of like 10 degrees a day. Like So they cool down at night like, like reptiles, like cold-blooded creatures yeah. do. Um, and then they use the energy of the sun, which is free, to heat themselves up in the morning. So they, you know, they'll head to the top of the trees in the morning and, and be sunbathing and soaking up all that free energy. And then that thick, shaggy coat of theirs keeps all that energy in, you see. So the combination of like solar gain and insulation is an awesome combination. Yeah, they've been doing it far longer than we have. They figured it, they figured that out, right? And then the other thing that they figured out is how not to then burn a lot of energy, right? So they don't run from danger. So they've got camouflage on they, their side, right? They don't even walk. They don't even walk, yeah. I mean, they do walk, but they do look pitiful if they're walking on the ground. I mean, I will, that is true. You see a sloth, you know, it's like a fish out of water. If it's out of the trees, it just, you know, they look really hopeless trying to cross a road, for example. I mean, it's, it's a tragic thing. But in the trees, they move like swan lake in slow mo in slow motion you know i mean they i i think they're mesmerizing to watch in the trees because they they move like a tai chi master with these very slow deliberate um extraordinary core strength you know with these the way that they can uh, they can move around um and what's particularly cool about their muscular system they have something like 30% less muscle mass than you'd expect of a, a creature, a mammal their size, like say that they're more or less the size of a, a cat, the bradipus, but they have a third less muscle mass. Um, and they've basically dispensed with the tricep, exactly. So that's the extensor muscle, isn't it? But they've retained the retractor muscle. So that's why they look so pitiful on the ground is they've evolved to dangle from trees, you know, because that that, it's that so does, efficient. It's it's energy efficient, right? You know, we're all actually even sitting here on these lovely, comfy vintage chairs. We're we're burning energy just to stay upright. Mm -hmm. You know, none of that. If you're dangling from a tree <laughs> like a happy hairy hammock, you know, the only <laughs> yeah. muscles that need to be working, well, in their case, they're not even muscles. Are that you know they clamp their claws tight and then can just dangle, and then they're not burning any energy at all. You know, the trouble is. You turn a sloth the wrong way up and gravity removes its dignity because it just it can't hold itself up. Oh, you know, no. so they they just sprawl, <laughs> you know, and then and then their way of moving is they just can't physically lift themselves up. So they, they kind of like mountaineering on a flat surface. And so, yeah, they look really hopeless when they, when you see them out of the trees and on the land. But but, you know, not having as much muscle mass. Great. Don't mm -hmm. burn as much energy. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So in order to sort of facilitate their dangling lifestyle, you know, they have a throat that allows them to swallow upside down. They have blood vessels that allow the blood to flow. One of the really great adaptations they have is they have co-opted, the bradipus has co-opted three of its ribs and turned them into vertebrae. So they have more neck bones than any other mammals. So like all mammals, uh, Bruce and a giraffe have the same amount of neck bones. Hmm. Amazing, hmm. but true. Mm -hmm. All mammals do, apart from um, bradipus sloths have, have three extra neck bones. They're not actually, they're actually ribs that have, have evolved into neck bones. But what that means that they do is when they're dangling in the trees, they can move their head through like 270 degrees and graze all around them without having to actually move their body and spend <laughs> energy. So, like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's just brilliant, right? I yes. mean, there are things that we can learn from them. If people like looking at pictures of sloths, then mm. they should check out your calendars. Your oh, calendars. yeah, that's okay. true. Yeah, I have a sideline in sloths. It's weird. It's not something that I, I, I would have ever planned, but I'm very delighted because I take photographs of them and people seem to like my photos and I've been doing it for years and years and years and years. And uh, yeah, there's a calendar that I produce with Workman, um, Sloth Appreciation Society wow. calendar of, of <laughs> photos of sloths that, mm -hmm. you know, will, will lower your cortisol, pretty, pretty guaranteed. <laughs> Looking at this calendar will 
will make you feel good. We all need a bit of that with our anxiety levels these days. So is the 2025 calendar out yet? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can get it everywhere. You know, okay. it's yeah. Okay. Everywhere where you buy books, yeah. you, you can probably buy it or they can order it for you. Okay. So online or in actual independent bookstores. Mm, everywhere. And uh, can you tell us about your books? About my books? Well, yeah, so um, I uh, I have written about sloths as well. I, there's a book called Life in the Sloth Lane, which is just a sort of like mindfulness tips and some facts about sloths and, and lots of gorgeous photos. photos of sloths. So that's okay. like, you know, uh, sloth eye candy and just about being mellow. That's just a, a gift book, really. But the other books that I've written are the sort of the adult books. Um, I wrote a book called The Truth About Animals, which was all about how... Um, how we misunderstand animals by by looking at them and anthropomorphizing you know and there's a chapter there on sloths which you know delves into all the ludicrous and and spiteful things that we used to say about them and then has more about their fantastic biology and then a bunch of other animals as well so um and then i also wrote a book called bitch uh, on the female of the species which is about how female animals were marginalized and misunderstood basically because darwin was a victorian man and and he, he just had a blind spot about females so with humans, all the testing is on males for whatever reasons. But mm. in the in zoology, did people only look at males or did they? Yeah. Oh, OK. That's what happened, basically, because da basically Darwin, you know, who was a meticulous and brilliant scientist, he just looked at the male animals and he described male animals as the dominant drivers of evolutionary change. They're the competitive, aggressive, promiscuous ones and females are passive. So the whole idea was that nothing to see there. You know, all mums are the same. I mean, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous to think that we thought this. And, you know, in some circles, I mean, papers are still published which have the assumption that females are, are very less than males, right? And wow. it's just... I mean, it is, it's, it's nuts, but um, so that has really, you know, so I wrote a book really about the, the animals and the scientists that have, are redefining what it means to be female, you know, um, and... Um, so so non-human females are not all passive and uninteresting <laughs> and unimportant. <laughs> Is that the takeaway? We, yeah, exactly. It's 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 about what a load of badass bitches uh, uh, female animals can be, um, awesome. and all sorts of species that uh, have 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 turned the the concept of femininity on its head, basically. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's been out a little while. And are, are you surprised mm -hmm. by any of the feedback or reaction you've gotten to that? Um, yeah, I mean, do you know what I've been really surprised. What I've been really surprised by is how. It's ended up on the curriculum of major universities around the world. I mean, I, I'm here because I was invited to speak at a cell biology s symposium for Harvard and I was at Mount Holyoke speaking there. And, you know, my intention is always to write books that are rigorously scientific, but are written in a way that it makes it very accessible for non-scientists, for mm -hmm. everyone. So, But you, you didn't expect them to be on the required reading syllabus for university classroom? <laughs> no, I did not, you know. But I think it's the first time that all of this this information has been collected in one place. What we're sort of really beginning to understand now as, as scientists is the, the, the effect of personal bias. You know, we all view the world through the prism of our own existence. And mm -hmm. it means that we project ourselves and our values and our lifestyles onto the onto our science, mm -hmm. you know, and and we need to be honest and humble about that. And mm -hmm. and so I think that it, it my book has sort of landed as part of this sort of revolution of of understanding that that we all need to recognize the scientific process. Hooray, it's fantastic. <laughs> but you know, there are humans behind that process, you mm -hmm. know, and so your beliefs can can shape mm -hmm. what you see. And, and right. evolution in the natural world are complicated and expansive and very much not binary absolutely there's you know many ways of being you know and 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 i think gloriously so you know the 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 diversity of of the natural world is the thing that uh, gives me goosebumps you know mm-hmm Thanks. Thanks for being on the show, Lucy. Oh, it's been Thanks. great talking to you both. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks.